Hi, um, we will get started in about two minutes. If you just come in, you can add your name and any agenda items to the meeting notes. All right. Are there any walk-in items that people have that you haven't added to the meeting notes? Yeah, I added two of them uh, just as Thanks. a follow-up yeah. on the discussion. Mm, the, the last week we had around right. the external network orchestration and about the glossary and the terms that to be added. So I think you created a discussion there. So added as a comment with a couple of uh, terms and their definitions to that. Great, thank you. Does anyone have anything else to add? Meeting notes are in the Zoom chat as well as Slack chat. Um, I'll just add the review of um, PRs that were merged during the week and any open PRs in addition to these. All right, that's at the end though. So if you would like to go over yours on the glossary a lexicon maybe would be the start and i can share my screen or you could share yours if you'd like yeah go ahead with the share maybe if you have it all right so first item this glossary lexicon open that up Yeah, so I think you created this uh, discussion for <clears throat> for the terms that needs to be added to the glossary and we can agree upon here and then create a PR as it says. So I added a couple of them like network attachment relates to primary as well as secondary networks and then uh, different types of networks like overlay, external networks, tenant networks. And so the intention is to uh, bring everyone on the, on the same page when it comes to when, when we are using these terms and what we are basically trying to um, define uh, for, the ex for the external network orchestration and the discussion so to ease out such discussions and that are we talking about the same thing so yeah so maybe go through the definitions and add comments and we can review it offline and in the comment section
Uh, thank you for this. I, I think there's a, I think we need to spend some time uh, reading it carefully. At least I do. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Does anyone have any comments or questions or anything right now or? Yeah, I, I'll chime in like something like pod. Um, I think we should avoid overloaded terms. Um, sure. So I actually use pod uh, internally kind of the way that Alok has it here. Um, but obviously pod means something very specific in the Kubernetes world as well, which is um, important, right? Um, <laughs> that is true. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I spent some time, okay, we, like you said, we, we use it heavily when it comes to saying about uh, optimized data centers, which involves compute switches and yeah, storage and, and the physical infrastructure belonging to. But but you are totally right. It's it's an overloaded term in at least in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So I'll I'll try to re yeah replace it with some some other. No, I mean, it's fine. Like everybody, we need to like help you through this. Right. But uh, like, cause like I said, I've used pods. Same, same thing with like the term availability zone. Um, yeah. you know, that's, that's a common term in the networking world. It's also a product feature in AWS. It's a mm -hmm. metadata construct in OpenStack. So, I mm -hmm. mean, I would say that, you know, the big thing is, is we try to, even if we do have a term, like maybe we keep pod, I'm not telling you to get rid of it. I'm just saying we have to be careful and explicit in the glossary yeah. because of these duplications. Uh, I try to make it as explicit as possible, but yeah, maybe we can go through it and then maybe. Yeah. But do we do we need the, the pod with capital P O D in this glossary at all? I mean, what what is the dependency on on that construct? We concept? might not need it even. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So we can even remove that. Yeah. If there is no need, yeah. then I think we should not introduce I, it. Yeah, I think we are not talking about the data center, or we can we can replace it with the data center. And I think data center. Why, why we, not data? We all of yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh. So yeah. Another quick comment: the the network attach, attachment. You know, talking about primary and secondary. Uh, that's very multi-specific, and maybe it's even going into too many details. You know, t talking about specifically relationship to pods. Um, yeah, I, I think we should talk about it in a, in a more abstract way, perhaps, uh, but, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I'm inclined to agree with Tal. Um, I would say if we're going to bring anything that's like, I don't know, product or solution specific, that maybe we just do like, um, like a prefix to it. Like if we're talking about like network attachment and we call it just that, it should be abstract to Tal's point. If we're gonna talk about like something that's specific to Multis, you should maybe you just put like Multish dash secondary network attachment or something. But um, really we don't wanna like do anything in the glossary that's already starting to pre-prescribe things or you know build something from a specific solution standpoint. We're trying to kind of get like this common understanding of just concepts mm -hmm. that way we can um, evaluate different solutions fairly and equally across the board um, so my, my suggestion and, and i know it's not a great suggestion is i've been using the term networking rather than network right network attachment what what we're really missing here is even a definition of what a network is <laughs> uh, but part of the problem here is that the kubernetes uh, plumbing Network plumbing sig already took over the uh, the term network attachment and network definition, so that's that's already you know and it's referenced here. So so that's already something that's defined, and and it's true. It, it is kind of defined in relation to multi specifically. So those terms do exist, but in some of the discussions we've been having, uh, I was using this. Ian was using it too. We were thinking of of a higher level kind of abstraction. And I was using the word networking rather than network. <laughs> and it's not great. I, I don't love that term, 
but it's a term I've been using to, to try to differentiate from the, the kind of lower level plumbing that, that is referenced specifically by Miltus. Um, I mean, I'll I would argue, about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I understand what you're after. I, I would still argue that the, uh, the term network attachment as coined by the uh, Kubernetes network <clears throat> plumbing working group is, is more generic than Multus. Multus is just a reference implementation of that concept. Um, so I think this is, deserves a place. We can kind of qualify it uh, here um, to mean exactly that. Yeah, and then we could right. we could have a more generic uh, um, abstraction of a secondary network attachment um, that encompasses the multus network secondary network attachment NSM secondary network attachments and any any other um, type of secondary network attachment. Yeah, that, that that's a good idea. I'll, to get a little bit technical here for people who aren't totally versed in this. Uh, so there is something called a network attachment definition, which is standardized, it's CRD, um, within the kind of standard Kubernetes uh, namespace. Uh, sorry, namespace is the wrong world, the naming <laughs> convention. Uh, Multa specifically adds an annotation to connect a pod to that network attachment definition. So, um, and I won't comment about how awkward those an annotations are. I'm not a, a big fan of them, but, um, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. The Multis way to, uh, to use those is specific to Multis, but a network attachment definition by itself uh, could live by itself. But the strange thing is, is if it lives by itself, there's no, <laughs> there's no definition no of how it will be used. Yeah, it, it doesn't have yeah. a lot of uh, specific meaning. Um, yeah. And also I'll point out, it's, it's, it's a very minor definition. The, the CRD is extremely simple. It's, it simply encapsulates a CNI configuration in JSON. Um, so there's not a lot there. <laughs> it's very, very generic. So on this note though too, when we talk about being generic or whether it's solution specific, I mean, the way that primary network is laid out, um, like I think we should, we should be careful like being generic in some areas and be specific and stuff because if it's all just like Kate centric networking then it should be like the Kate's primary network or something so th this is the awkward place that we arrive when we come to like CNFs is if you talk to a network operator and you talk about primary networks right um, they're not thinking about it from a Kate's perspective right like exactly. and at least in most cases so like I'm hesitant to use terms like primary network and then it have very specific Kate's connotations um, like just because we're trying to bridge two worlds here. I mean, if you talk to a Kubernetes person and you said primary network, they're probably gonna have their own biases. So I, I think we should be like explicit with our terminology when it's important. Um, mm -hmm. Or if we do do something that's vague, like network attachment, then it should be, to t you know, like what Tal was saying, it should be abstracting, you know, cover all potential implementations or like at least accommodate for like the different ways that you might attach a network that isn't 100%, you know, just Kate specific. Right, I, I think that's a very good point. I'll add that, you know, we usually talk about planes in our networking world. So we would call this maybe the Kubernetes control plane. But then at the same point, sometimes the data plane, plane piggybacks over the control plane, you know, as the primary network. Uh, so, you know, other terminologies that we use are things, so planes, and we also have fabrics. Uh, I think this is a very good start to help us thinking, but I think we there's a lot more stuff in the glossary we need to add and, and think about. Um, but but thank you for this. This is this is a good opening shot. Perhaps a, a better term might be default uh, Kubernetes network. Yeah, it makes it very explicit. Yeah, during yeah. the discussion, I was thinking the same. Could be yeah. Could be a way to and, say the and, same. Mm -hmm. And, and default also gives the implication that there may be other networks attached to it as well. So it, as opposed to just a, a unified uh, mm. primary or secondary, like secondary even gives the connotation that there's only two networks when there, there may be more than two as well. So I, I have a preference for calling it a plane because network is so overloaded. It, it's more than just a network, you know, the, the, this is, the technicality of it, yes, it's an IPv3, <laughs> sorry, it's a, it's a third layer uh, uh, IP network. Uh, dual stack right now is supported in, in the latest version of Kubernetes. So 
we can talk about it that way, but it's implemented often using some sort of fabric, some sort of SDM controller. So um, I, I'm more inclined to call it a plane. And then that plane itself is, is implemented through various networking solutions, right? Um, no, I'm with you because we have something, if you scroll down a little bit, it's like control network. I've, I've never, I've, you know, it's always in my mind, it, that's a control plane, right? Like, yeah. um, and so we have data planes and then data planes, you know, can be subdivided. So the, the thing too, that's going to be tough is figuring out like how networky, you know, I'm going to make that a word um, we get just because I've definitely, you know, dealing with like the eds of the world in the past, it calls us the sneaky network people they tend to like get a little queasy when we start talking about overlays and this and that. But when we start talking about like a default Kubernetes network and stuff or a control plane Kubernetes network, I mean, there's still an overlay involved, right? Like you're writing on top of the underlay, you're doing IP and IP or some type of other encapsulation method that the CNI is brokering for you. So like it needs to be like explicit enough that real networking people who are gonna have to like plumb these CNFs into their networks you know, once again, there's that overloaded term, it makes sense to them, but at the same time, you know, it, it's accessible to like maybe the more cloud side of the house where everything has just been abstracted in a YAML file up until this point. Right, I, we not, care yeah. very much about the implementation details. That's, that's the difference between us, I think, and some of the other parts of the Kubernetes world. I'll just add that Cilium might not be using overlay networks. <laughs> there are other solutions to, to implementing that Kubernetes control plane. Well, not you know, I, yeah. And sure, even like any of the ones that have direct BGP attachment, right? Um, there's ways to like right, directly right. peer with the underlay. So, I, but that's that's the thing, though, right? Is that's why it's important to acknowledge planes, like you said, it's important to acknowledge overlays, etc., because that drastically right. changes even at the CNI layer where we do have some of these, um, you know, just core case constructs. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> that's a good one. I, I I've gone through this before with that because we did the same thing. We're like. You, you bridge these two worlds, like in the NSM space, where like nobody agreed on what a network was, what an attachment was, what an interface, even in, like the term interface was like this super complicated thing for all of us to like agree on. So, um, but I, I do like the idea collectively of us like centering around the concept of um, networking, networks, planes and overlays, because it, it kind of helps clarify those implementation, imp implementa can't talk, implementation details that you were describing. And the last part I'll say on this is it's important, right? Because if we go with something like Cilium, then the NAT assumptions that we come into typically when we're dealing with Kubernetes, because we start talking about that primary network, for instance, like some of those assumptions may be false in certain contexts. So we don't want our terms to like specifically lead us astray. Yeah. And uh, another really good example, and this is one of the ones that we, uh, it was the, the early writing on the wall that it was much more complex was uh, Calico. So in fact, uh, when the plumbing group was being created, we met all, we all met in person in Austin and uh, it was at the time called the multi-interface group. And one of the things that we had agreed upon was to get rid of that specific name because with Calico, if you want to add something or change something, you weren't going to add a, a secondary network to it or a secondary interface. Instead, you're going to uh, render your uh, your thing into into Calico, and then Calico could make the right cost changes or whatever whatever else that you want to to make that's within its capabilities. So we, we do want to be very careful in that it may not be a second a secondary network. Uh, it may just be a configuration that's flipped in a uh, in a control plane that causes the uh, the functionality that you want within a single interface, a single uh, a single network. But from a from a production perspective or from an operational perspective, it still ends up with that separation that you want. Um, I'll point out another thing. What one of the one of the things I hope that will be a deliverable from this group is suggestions recommendations for the plumbing group. So as I said, the curtain network attachment definition accepted by the plumbing group is extremely, extremely generic and simple. And, and it's obvious why, you know, it's, there's just so many, um, um, th there are a lot of problems to reach an agreement and alignment that, that would please uh, everybody. But, you know, we're, we're a group that I think is, is uh, <laughs> we are versed in these things. So, so, 
I don't know how much it's set in stone already, the, the network attachment definition. Also, of course, as you guys know, in, in CRDs, you can version things. So, uh, so maybe the version one of, this, of the CRD that exists now, or maybe it's version one, alpha one, uh, that's already set in stone, but we could potentially think about a version two of that network attachment definition that would eventually encapsulate a lot of the uh, new thinking that, uh, that we might introduce here. So, um, Anyway, my, my hope is to eventually get to that point. That might take a while. Yeah, and it's something that we we should not try to deconflict the entire world here. We should just deconflict and explicitly say what we mean ourselves uh, locally, because like even something like uh, data plane, like we had conversations where it's like, oh, well, this is a data plane. Oh, no, no, that's actually a control plane. The real data plane is here. And then it's like, you look at the hardware. Oh, no, no, that's the control plane on the hardware. The real data plane is here. It's like turtles all the way down. And so we should uh, we should draw a line somewhere and say, here's explicitly what we mean. Uh, we're okay with, uh, we're, we're okay that it doesn't cover 100% of the edges. It should be clear what we what we mean. And if it's not clear, then let's make sure that we, we get that clarity but without having to deconflict for, for across the whole industry. Right, I'll just point out that there can be many control planes and many data planes. <laughs> it's a control plane, not the control plane necessarily. It, exactly, it's, um, you know, my, my data plane is someone else's control plane. So, so yeah, one definition that, that, that I didn't sorry. found in this list uh, is underlay and network definition. So do you think that is important to include in the list? I, I think long-term personally it is because when we start talking about overlays, you need to have context for what you're writing on top of. I mean, at, at some point, you know, you need to understand that like if you're pulling in say an SRV like VFID into a pot or something, then that means you're starting to get like down into the weeds and I'm like, who knows, maybe the best practice is eventually say SROV is a bad idea. Um, but when you start getting into those low level things and you start like doing um, direct peering into the underlay or even something like Calico, right? When you, you peer with the underlay versus building an overlay on top, like you need to have that concept of an underlay and an overlay in place. Um, and then it's exactly like the planes. It's not the overlay, it's an overlay, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would say that it's important. Yeah, I, I tend to think of it as if it's something you have to build before you can establish connectivity, then it's it's maybe it not guaranteed, but it may be an underlay. Uh, so, for example, I if I have two Kubernetes clusters and I want to hook two Istio uh, based overlays to each other uh, or two Istio based systems, uh, I cannot just say, "Hey, here's the connection." Like I have to go build something else before I can start establishing those uh, those Istio connections. So in that scenario, that thing that I have to build underneath is a, is a candidate for being called an, over, an underlay. Uh, so that's, that tends to be how, how I try to position or think of it, but I know that there's, there's rough edges to that definition as well. Well, you know, it's the, another term that might need some definition is mesh, right? I think we keep inventing new terms because network is already taken. So there's fabric, plane, mesh, and I was always curious why network service mesh uh, took that term, but uh, yeah, I don't know if mesh even has a, a common definition. Well, it's just it, a, it is a mesh of, of network services. And so that's why we chose that, that term. Um, it, uh, uh, yeah. it does meet, it, it, does, it does meet that. We negotiate connections between each other. We establish those connections. And uh, the, other, the other phrase would be to call it a, a DAG or, or not even DAG, it's, a, it's also a graph, but yeah, it's it is a it it, it is a hard problem picking yeah. uh, picking names that don't conflict with each well, other. I mean, all of these things are graphs, all of them. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so. yeah. Tell um, one of the I think very important things that you pointed out was if ideally we can get recommendations accepted or um, at least seriously considered upstream into Kubernetes. And I think the, uh, the important thing out of that would be to make sure that whatever we use, we can communicate clearly how it relates to existing terms. 
so the conversations earlier around um, like pod and other stuff, if we feel like we have, we need to use a term and ident and show it where there's a conflict in the meaning, then we need to be very clear in wherever we use it, what we mean. And if we can do that, then when we present use cases, then they'll be a lot easier to consume because what we're asking is for people to take their time to read through, understand what we're wanting, what we need, and then try to find solutions. So if, if we're going to do that, we want to make the barrier of entry as low as possible. And I would, I would suggest whenever possible, we try to use those existing terms, whatever they are. Yeah, and, and by the way, one of the things we can con contribute upstream, it, it doesn't have to be something technical in terms of a new definition, it could be updating the documentation, right? Right now, the documentation for Kubernetes networking is <laughs> problematic, I think, for some of us. Uh, uh, some of the language there won't fit some of the concepts we have here. It's not generic enough. Um, so, so that could be something that we would do upstream, you know, help, help Kubernetes find better language. Um, I mean, it, it's no mistake that it took so long for Kubernetes to finally get dual stack IP support. Um, so some of the initial thinking was just uh, not thinking far enough ahead. <laughs> so one thing we can help is, is really um, better conceptualize, right? The, the, how networking is described in Kubernetes upstream. But we'll yeah, see, yeah. I don't know. That's putting the carriage before the, the horse maybe. I think uh, we have a lot of work to get there. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would even go far enough to, to suggest that early Kubernetes was not even concerned about things like uh, IP or, or similar. It was primarily concerned with just connectivity. Like I have a name, it resolves to something. Can I, can I connect yeah. to it? And there were basically three properties that if it if you met it, then it was a happy. Like can nodes talk to nodes, can nodes talk to pods, and can pods talk to pods. And how that happened, it didn't uh, it didn't care whether it was one IP, multiple IPs, or or something else. Like it was to try to to detach as much as possible and see a loof of the network as much as possible, which. Um, turns out there was more complexity there than um, that uh, occurred <laughs> right. because of because of that. Well, I mean, I mean, there was a basic assumption that would it would be TCP/IP version four with a specific subnet. So it it, it was making certain assumptions, <laughs> and that's that's part of the problem, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but possibly yeah. IP is is probably the one the one assumption that it made uh, in, in that in that path, right? Yeah, I should say not TCP, specifically IP is the assumption. All right. Um, so is can there I, anything can I else before quick? we move on? Oh, oh, I was just saying, yeah. can you go back to the discussion, mm -hmm. Taylor? Um, so Which area, I would say over here or? The, um, in, in Git, this, and if okay. you scroll up, um, mm -hmm. so I don't know if you guys remember like very first call or second call, I said we needed to define CNF. Um, people came at me with pitchforks, and then, sure enough, none of us agreed what it was um, when the first PR was put in. So um, I've made another attempt to pull this one from the tug. I think that this is a definition we should probably get done sooner than later because it's kind of specific to our domain here and kind of what we're trying to contribute versus modify, like you know, from an originality standpoint. And then. If there's any agreement on this, I'll put a PR in for it. And I'd also like us to start the argument on what does cube native mean? I mean, and I, for the record for cube native, I, I'm, I'm okay with just saying that it's designed intrinsically to run in Kubernetes, but I'm sure people will want more than that. Mm. I, I saw, sorry, I'm late by the way, I got another meeting and I only just got out of it, but I saw Gergay made a perfectly reasonable point that um, Kubernetes varies from version to version, but you know, applications still run on Kubernetes regardless of the version. So I think there's something we can do with Kube native here. Yeah, so I mean, first he's got the cloud native, like um, Victor kind of talked about maybe just rephrasing it a little bit. I mean, I, I'm fine with whatever, but um, I would like us to just have a starting point for when we say we're, 
working on CNF stuff, what does a CNF mean? <laughs> I find it horrifying we have to define it, but I think it's the, LF, uh, it's the emperor with no clothes in many regards. We can't work without having a definition. We can't just assume everybody has the same definition in their heads. Well, not only that, but like we should assume that like this definition is really just a placeholder because we, we just got done discussing for 30 minutes the fact that basically everything that we're using to build the definition of a CNF, CNF is poorly defined. So then you get into this weird chicken and an egg scenario. But like, I mean, as people come and start checking us out, keep, keep kind of use what happened and right around the corner, this and that, like if people just want to go back to their boss and say, this is what a CNF is based on what I heard from the CNF working group or the tug, they at least have something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add that, you know, some definitions can be very specific and they can be very generic. So we could potentially word something that uh, is kind of a big tent definition that allows for uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, specificities. Uh, we, we are going to have to accept that someone's going to disagree with our definition um, because as things stand, um, as I say, it gets a bit vague as to what precisely is and is not a CNF. Um, so I think even with a fairly light-handed definition, we'll catch somebody out. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, we don't have to go too far in depth. It doesn't need to be, it runs with a certain kind of networking. It, it requires CPU pinning, this kind of thing. And in fact, that isn't part of the CNF definition. I think we all accept, but somebody will say it is. So you know, we, we're going to have to find some middle ground there. Jeffrey, there's already a, a dedicated discussion for this one, and I would suggest that we move, keep it over there because CNF, the, the comments, it's pretty short here, but if we go over in the, the original discussion that you started, there's a lot more um, back and forth on that. I think I'll just put the PR in later today and I'll probably incorporate some of um, Victor's suggestions. Uh, and then, you know, this comes to Tao's point earlier, like that, that's the one I pulled from the tug white paper. Um, the first one that caused all the like conflict was the one I pulled from the CNF principles, um, et cetera. Like, you know, at some point too, we could just, the thing is, is theoretically all of this is agile. Theoretically all of this is open, right? So if we do something here, and we've modified something that we've you know borrowed from another place we can always attempt to go put prs and those um adjoining repos to you know try to make sure that there's not this definition sprawl going around i mean i don't think it's any secret to anybody that like it's probably going to be the same 12 people who are looking at the tug repo as the ones that are on this call right now so i doubt it'll be that big of a challenge Frederick, um, I think you put forward the the term of using cube native. Do you have any feedback on that? Or is there something written out that you've seen or that you have? So I didn't write anything down on it specifically. The, the thought process that I had on here was one of the traps that we that we ran into was trying to keep it too, too generic. So with cloud native, we don't want to make the assumption that it's, uh, that it, that it runs any specific place in the cloud, but instead to try to, to drive down what we mean to a, to a smaller thing. Like I would argue things like if you create a build pack, which runs in Lambda or runs in cloud run, uh, and you were to run in that, uh, that would also be cloud native, but it's likely not what we're looking for in these conversations. And so the, the term cube native was uh, thrown out specifically to try to provide some initial direction saying, hey, what are the things that we need to do in order to get these things to not only running in the uh, Kubernetes environment, but to, to run well. But we also have a, there's also a trap here because it is possible to weld ourselves too much 
to Kubernetes and the way that it currently does things where uh, as Kubernetes itself evolves or maybe another platform comes around in the future that uh, we're, uh, we're stuck in a similar position as we were before of not being able to run well. So I think it's, uh, it's a, a balance. We, we, don't, we don't want to turn the crank too far, but I think the term, I still think the term is, is, still, is still useful, but I'm, I'm okay with, uh, with dropping it in favor of another term as well, mm. uh, if that's what the group would like. I, the, the purpose, I think, originally was purely to say that calling something cloud native does not mean it runs on containers and saying it runs in containers does not mean it runs on Kubernetes. And so Kube native was a shortcut through the whole discussion so that we didn't use cloud native to mean something it didn't mean. Um, so if we if we try and keep it that light and airy, so it's just really a shortcut for what about 70% of people actually mean when they say cloud native because they're not being careful with their words then we might get somewhere with that. Yeah. Because we're not a, trying to build network functions that run on anything but Kubernetes here. We're trying to say, you know, not cloud native network functions or containerized network functions, but network functions that run on Kubernetes. We're not pretending that anything else is our goal, I don't think. Yeah, like if, if and I maybe were to give, more explicit. Uh, go ahead, Frederick. Like if I were to create an L2 network, and I was to expose it behind an API that you could then use, add into a cloud in order to connect to this also network. Like, is, is that cloud native? And some of the definitions would say yes, because it's, it's nicely accessible through an API. You can declaratively state it, what it is and so on. Uh, and other scenarios, people would argue no, because it uses primitives which don't lend itself well to cloud uh, to cloud environments or things that tend to work well across cloud environments. So that's what I was trying to, I was trying to be careful in, in not having to argue those particular types of things. It's like, it could be, we could say, here's, here's the best way to run within Kubernetes on how to interact with it and separates out the, the question as to whether it's a good idea to, to expose out these types of things. Like what, what's, well, what are our best practices towards this, and what is something that runs well in those in those environments, and separate the two out so that we don't uh, and and I, and isolates the conversation specifically to things that are that are within Kubernetes rather than try to drag in a whole range of other things, which we may eventually have to jump into some of those things, but uh, but we don't we don't have to do them now. So I I don't know if this is helpful or or will complicate things anymore, but. Um... Uh, for me, I, I never liked the term cloud native network function. I, I don't refer to workloads as cloud native. Cloud native to me implies a set of practices. So you could potentially take a network function that was not designed necessarily with cloud native practices, but wrap it in some sort of orchestration system, connectivity layer, a set of operators that cloud nativizes it, right? Makes it work much better within the Kubernetes environment in a way that could make it seem cloud native. Whether the workload itself was designed that way is almost beside uh, the point. A, a little bit of historic context. Uh, what you're describing is exactly what we meant. As in, it's not enough to do a lift and shift, but you really should redesign it to, mm -hmm. to work in a cloud native environment. So if you have something that was a lift and shift and the containerized, mm -hmm. that, that is not the intention of, uh, of cloud native network functions. Uh, it was. It's literally how do you design following twelve factor apps, creating good metadata that you can then consume and you can then reason about it. So that way, your scheduler can make decisions about your workload. Like, oh, you're a workload that supports IP. I'm not going to join you to something that only speaks uh, Ethernet frames. Instead, I'll make sure I connect you to something else that's IP. Or oh. if you use uh, SRLV. I'll connect you to an SRLV thing uh, and make sure you get all that in the scheduler. But, but it, I mean, uh, and we're going to go around this, I mean, because I want to contradict Tal and I'm going to bite my tongue and not. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a productive way of using our time on this call because there are probably as many perspectives as what cloud native means or could mean as there are people on this call. Um, so let's take this to the discussion if we really want to have it. But I think, yeah, as we... I say, it started with, is Kube native a useful way of a useful sub definition of what cloud native means. And I think it could be here because it's yeah, more specifically and, what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and, and, and to add to that, we, we spent well over a year trying to get people to come to agreement on what it means to be cloud native network function. And there's still no agreement on that. So 
uh, that that's the other reason for driving towards uh, cube native was to avoid all of the discussion around that because it's a that's a trap that will that will lead us down towards a dark hole that we, we may never emerge from. I mean, it seems to me that what we're trying to do here is build and find best practices for building applications that usefully serve end user needs and run on Kubernetes. Because it isn't the cloud nativeness of the application. It isn't the kube natives of the application so much as does it help? Yeah, that was pretty much my point as well. You know, um, it's kind of nice to idealize and think of these pure, excellent cloud native functions that are out there. But for example, our whole our whole conversation about network networking orchestration is not CNF specific. I mean, you could work with PNFs as well. We're, we're, we're thinking about the environment in, in which these network functions are going to be running, which is Kubernetes based. But of those pure cloud native right. functions, name three. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, I, I don't think I'm helping here. I'm, I'm just making it more, uh, more dispersed. We're, we're, we're all saying that there is a difficulty here. We all see it. We're all using different words to try and solve it, but this isn't a meeting for solving things because if it was, it would be a lot longer than an hour. It would be all week, eight hours a day. Um, let's everyone, if you if you have thoughts on Cube Native, then please add it. If we feel if we feel like we need a new end to the discussion. Um, thread and if you feel like we need a dedicated thread just for cube native then create one we do already have a dedicated thread for cnf definition so feel free to add in here and then um ian you uh, well sorry not ian jeffrey i think dropped jeffrey is going to create a pr so we'll see what that looks like for the cnf let's move on um Hello, are you still with us? Do you want to talk about the discussion 118? Yeah, I think uh, there were some comments that we collected last time, just at the end of this discussion. If you scroll down, um, I think Jeffrey had some points. Unfortunately, he, I think he dropped already, but uh, um, there was an. Are you still around, Jeffrey? So I think there was a discussion about should we consider external network orchestration to be part of Kubernetes ecosystem or does operator sitting inside a Kubernetes cluster should be accountable to such kind of a, um, orchestration role? So, uh, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, it seems to me that we've got Danem Maltus, this, NSM, a bunch of theoretical things that could exist but don't. Um, they're solutions to a problem. They could potentially be a best practice if, if you can make a strong argument that one of them does everything that could possibly be conceived of and could never be better, right? There is a perfection here and you've reached it. Um, and I presume you're not arguing that ENO is that. You're saying ENO is, you know, better, not the best ever. Um, the question Ian, I Ian. want to um, yeah. Uh, I think that, that's not our point. Ian, mm. Ian, Ian is not at all substituting mm. or replacing any of those that you mentioned. It is complementing them because it's filling a gap for which there is nothing there today. And that mm. is to orchestrate networks that then Multus and the CNIs can use in order to mm. attach pods to them. Right. So you're thinking in terms of more uh, the connectivity that Multis doesn't address as opposed to the um, presentation that Multis some does address. But I mean, all right, fine. Multis um, fills a very small gap uh, or task, and that is to, to, to plumb pods to networks that, that already exist and are configured mm. up to a certain level inside the cluster on the worker node. Mm. That's what the CNI does. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so all right. you know, EU is addressing all the rest that is there in, to set up those networks in the fabric and inside the cluster and maybe on the DC gateway. 
in order right. for, to prepare the infrastructure for, for Multus to do its job or for right. Diamond to do its job yeah, or anything so like that. That's fine. Um, what I was trying to, I, I may have not used the most elegant words to do it, but the, the point I was getting to is you can take this two ways. Either you can say that ENO itself is the best practice or should be a best practice because um, it solves this problem either as well as anything does right now or as well as it ever will be solved. Um, the, the second part of this is rather than take ENO, the implementation, you take the problem space it's trying to address, which I think is what you were just talking about. You were saying that connectivity is an issue. And you say, what have we just learned about the problem space? I mean, what's your end? If I left you to your own devices, if I got you to write the best practices, what best practices would you write based on what you know about ENO? Hypothetically, anything will do. I mean, with the external, with e, ENO, we basically bringing the, like Jan said, the, the automation for the external mm -hmm. networks, which then eventually be consumed by the network managers like Maltus or Danum and yeah. NSM. So yeah. we kind of bringing the sense of automation for, for such networks that will then later be consumed by the network functions, which doesn't mm -hmm. exist today in, yeah. the, in the ecosystem. Yes, but so yeah. I, I'm saying best practices. So what so. best practice would you write that either declares that ENO is the best practice or points strongly towards ENO as a good solution that solves the best practice? How would you phrase that? I'm not sure, Ian, I understand what you're after at all, I must say. I'm completely puzzled. Uh, what do you mean with best practice? Well, we, have a, we, have, we have a challenge. We have a challenge today. If an mm -hmm. operator deploys a Kubernetes cluster, he has to manually set up all the networking underneath and inside the cluster in order mm -hmm. to prepare for these uh, secondary network attachment uh, managers like Multus and, and this, the CNIs that they, yeah. they control to do their work. So we don't have a best practice today. What we are trying to do is to create something that that gives, that provides an, an API, mm -hmm. uh, a, a Kubernetes-style API, so it it is it is uh, it, it's meaningful to actually host it on the cluster itself, mm -hmm. uh, a CRD, to provide an interface, a, a declarative way for for um, an orchestrator to 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 create those networks automatically. Mm -hmm. All right, that's yes. that's the idea. That's what we're after. Yeah, yeah. right. And the reason I'm bringing it back to best practices is because that's what this group writes. And I'm trying to work out how we use those best practices to argue that ENO is great or it's bad or it's as good as you're getting right now. And I think what you're saying is that um, a best practice here that we're looking for is that you have a set of APIs. Well, an initial best practice is that you have a set of APIs that allow you to reconfigure the network so that you can attach to where you want to attach to. And a long-term best practice would be you use precisely this API because this API is standard. And if you use it, you'll work on any, any Kubernetes deployment you find. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we could, you, you know, again, neither of those actually says ENO in it. But the thing I'm trying to, um, I, I'm not trying to say ENO is good or bad. You've heard that I have my, I've thought about this and I, I think there are other things we can do here. But that's not to say that I'm right in my choice of implementation. I'm just trying to work out what it tells us that we can use from a best practice perspective. And I think I do absolutely accept that um, ENO lets you do something that you need to do. And, and interestingly also that today you can't practically speaking do. Right. So if we were to write, you know, um, user stories and use cases are not um, altruistic in my experience. You write them with a fairly pointed aim of saying there is a hole here that we need to fix. So what you're saying here is I would like to connect to the network that sits next to my cloud and 
I currently can't do that. Um, I'm going to, well, you don't have to say I can't do that. You simply have to say in order to do that, I am going to need these things. And that's where I think I would take your, what you have and phrase it as this is going to be a necessary component of whatever solution we build because you aren't going to have network functions if you can't actually attach them to the right bit of the network where you want them to be attached. Am I yes. Scared? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, that, that's our proposal here. That's uh, that's mm. the the thing that we want to say. We the, the the aim is that we we define a northbound API, a Kubernetes style API, that can mm -hmm. be hosted on the cluster itself to pro, to provide an interface that can be consumed by orchestrators running on top of the clusters to actually do all the necessary network plumbing inside yeah. the data center uh, to prepare for these networks to be consumed by CNFs. Yeah, Full stop. and, I think and that, that, that yeah. is very open. And the example that we have shown and that we are that we are coding in the POC is focusing on the very simple first use case to provide mm -hmm. uh, kind of bridge domains across the fabric to connect yeah. to connect uh, uh, secondary network interfaces to yeah. the DPH, right? Yeah. But that's a, just a starting point. And there may no, be no, no. other more interesting use cases that will require additional API constructs uh, to model mm. them successfully. And yeah. we are 100% open to that. What yeah. we're after uh, is the main, the main thing we're after is that we believe there should be such an API and an operator underneath it that automates this. Yes, it sounds, I agree. Like, I, um, it sounds like there are some best practices that are at least being are part of the design for you're trying to get some type of practical solution that could be used and at a minimum you're saying declarative apis for configuring the network but i was hearing other words that were mixed into the like communication about what is Zena doing and what are you trying to accomplish that i would say would be at least ideas of best practices that should be used and then some things that sounded like more of the implementation side underneath maybe you're, it's the best practice or not. When you're talking about the plumbing and northbound side and everything else, there's some concepts in there that are maybe not best practice, but something else. So taking some time to go through what Eno is and identifying here is an area that we actually are trying to follow a best practice. And here's an area where there is no best practice or we don't know about it and we're trying to solve this. And if those could be labeled or identified, then we could look at the items that maybe don't have best practices and think more about those. Yeah, I, I think also there's some things about, you know, as it is, its current implementation, the fact that it does layer two networking. Um, that one, I think, um, I mean, you've heard my opinion on this before, but it, it isn't, to my mind, necessarily a best practice because, you know, there are other ways of doing networking. They may or may not be more valuable. Um, so that one might be more of an implementation choice. But again, it sounds like we've just said, not really the focus of this. The focus of this is that we have absolutely a blank wall here. We can't do anything with networking. And that itself is the problem that we need to address. And regarding the L2 network, I think that's just one of the network mm. scenario and the implement the initial implementation of you know with, with the yes. fairly straightforward use case that we have chosen no. today. So I'm um, I mean, yeah. So, that's fine. I, 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 I completely appreciate why we do that because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a simple thing to do. It's logical, it's basic, and actually it plays the history so everybody understands it. Totally mm -hmm. fine. <clears throat> and it may well have its uses, and that's completely good as well. Um, but I think if we divorce the two, then you don't lose one argument because you're trying to win the other one. You've got your, your we need a decent networking API. We need to figure out what that networking API would do. We can work through some use cases or user stories specifically to work out how it could be used when it's a matter of network admin problems versus CNF owner problems. Those are all valuable things to address. Yeah, I totally all agree. Right. But whatever um, we do, we must not lose this simple basic use case because it plays, if you like it or not, it plays a very prominent hmm. part uh, today. And we will have to continue to support it for a long time for uh, many of these container cloud native network functions that have been built now based on existing technology. 
including SRIV and all these things. We don't like yeah. them. They are not cloud native, but they are out there and we need to support them and we need to automate them as well. Well, well could you, can you yeah. work on adding the use cases? And you just mentioned several. I heard at least a t three, I would say, that could come out of that quick comment. And I think those are important to keep. Could you work on PRs to create those use cases? Or at least so, create discussions for that? So we can do that. Yeah. All right. I want to quickly go through, uh, we got about a minute. So uh, switch on uh, what's been merged. So we switched to individuals and the interested parties. I think I clicked the wrong link there. So interested parties. If anyone would like to add themselves, it's now just a long list of anyone interested. And then we tried to attach uh, names, uh, company names to everyone. So we see that. So this is backwards compatible with what we've ex existing have, but please, um, if you're not on here and you'd like to be added, then do a PR request to add yourself and it has your, the GitHub username. We remove the tech leads from from the governance items until we need them. We can add them back later if we, if, if we decide that it's necessary, but to simplify things, uh, we've- we, we, What we were trying to do there more. is, they, they've kind of grown up as a concept without really having a purpose. So we thought it was better to remove the wording until we found what we want people to do, and then we will fold it back in. So it's not like they've gone and they've gone forever. We're not trying to change the way things work. We're just trying to make sure that that need drives change versus you know change for change's sake. Yep. All right. Um, and let's see the acceptance process for delegation. This has been merged. So this is about. Um, the simpler items um, will be based on the contributing guide and the pull request information. So all of this is uh, now merged in there and you can see that. And I think those are the top ones. Um, there's a few pull requests some pretty minor ones, but if, if you want to review and give any feedback, that's there. We still want to get Vuk's um, use case through, so please do some reviews on that, and let's hopefully get that in by end of week. Thanks, everyone, for your time. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye.